okay, okay. I, I can. I can. I can. I can go. Okay, now it's okay. <laughs> I cannot see. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, dear readers. Uh, today uh, we are continuing with IEEE Connecting Experts series. Um, my name is Mark from IEEE Young Professionals Turkey uh, as, a, as a treasurer and secretary. Uh, today we have an outstanding guest with an outstanding topic, uh, uh, Dr. Sertaj Bayhan. Uh, hello, Dr. Bayhan. Hi, how are you? Hi, fine, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bayhan is uh, working in uh, Qatar Environment and, uh, and Energy Research Institute now, uh, and as a, a senior scientist and uh, associate professor in College of Science and Engineering, Ahmad in Khalifa University. Uh, he has uh, several awards and uh, outstanding history. Uh, now uh, we can uh, we can go on with, with your presentation, Dr. Bayan. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, for the nice introduction. Good afternoon, all, uh, and thank you for joining this event. Uh, it is my pleasure to be with uh, you, and thank you uh, for uh, Umar uh, for inviting me in this IEEE Connecting Expert Program. And uh, during my talk today, I'm going to present the microgrid structure and uh, how microgrids help us to, to reach uh, smart and cleaner uh, energy for the future power system. Uh, my talk is uh, will uh, take around 40 minutes. I hope uh, you will enjoy the presentation. Now let me start with the agenda of my presentation. Uh, first, I will share some basic uh, information about uh, the microgrids, then uh, a brief uh, overview of renewable energy sources and uh, energy storage system will be presented. After that, uh, I will summarize some key points in, uh, in power electronics and, uh, and microgrid control. And uh, finally, I will present the microgrids, a lot and facilities what we have in uh, in Kiri at Qatar. Now, in this slide, you can see the the overall structure of the traditional power uh, network. Uh, as you can see here, it contains a large generation uh, station, step up transformer, uh, transformers, long transmission lines, step down transformers distribution lines, uh, and of course the loads. Actually, it is almost the same power st uh, system structure that we have uh, in many countries right now. Now, uh, now let us think about the, this question. Why do we need to, uh, to transform the current power grid? What are the, the handicaps and what are the driving forces we are going to, to change this uh, traditional power system? As you know, uh, the electric power grid is one of the largest and uh, the most complex uh, infrastructures uh, ever built by mankind. However, many critical uh, technologies uh, such as the transformers were developed at the beginning of the 20th uh, century and have changed very little since then. Uh, in addition to this, the traditional unidirectional power flow uh, through the transmission line has also changed nominally but it, 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 it no longer uh, meets the needs of the 21st century energy market customers. It is clear that many traditional industries nowadays are transformed by digital internet technology. However, as you know, the traditional electric energy market is uh, lagging significantly behind this. For that reason, a move uh, towards a full digital grid is uh, required. Such a digital grid needs a tight integration of the physical layer physical with digital and cyber uh, information to, to allow real-time marketing to, to the e-commerce world. Because right now, as, as I just said, right now the, the industry, they are using the, the industry 4.0, but unfortunately our power system is uh, significantly behind this technology. Another major factor that is pushing for this radical transformation uh, is the rapidly changing uh, patterns in energy resources ownership and, of course, the load patterns. The load patterns is not the same what we, we used to uh, around maybe 10 years or 20 years ago. To sum up, uh, the traditional, uh, traditional grid structure has many handicaps, as you can see here, large generation units, centralized control, unidirectional power flow, uh, few customer choices, 
power losses and uh, the, the important one is the, uh, the, the current power system unfortunately it is blind. Uh, furthermore, in the slides you can see some of the driving forces. Uh, some of these are historical, such as reliability issue, operational efficiency, losses, and of course the security, cyber security of the system. And others are recent and uh, emerging uh, driving forces, environmental regulations because of the, uh, the, the carbon footprint and uh, new sources, for example, the electric vehicles. And for that reason, we need to transform uh, the traditional power system into new structure or even new structures. Here you can see the power layer of the future grid structure. It is clear that there is diversity in power generation, not only non-renewable energy, we have also uh, renewable energy, and also not in the power generation side, as you can see here, we have a generation in the distribution side, and as well as uh, in the power consumption side. I mean that as a customer, I can generate my own energy for the future power system. In addition to the power system, the future power system, as I just mentioned before, needs the communication layer in order to control uh, the distribution generation and optimize the power flow in, uh, in the power system. Without communication layer, we cannot achieve uh, power flow uh, harmony between the sources. Here also you can see these figures illustrate the, the main difference between the power system in the past and power system in the future. You can see here, right now we have, there are many small power producers in the future instead of large power plants. And we are aiming to use uh, de de decentralized control instead of uh, centralized. And of course, the most important uh, part the power system in the future will be both direction, not only unidirectional. And of course, there will be many consumer choice. Well, uh, at this point, I can say that microgrid concept uh, will play critical role to achieve all these uh, goals and objectives in the future power system. Uh, now let's look at uh, what is the definition of the microgrid. You can see here, uh, actually there are a lot of definition uh, about the microgrid, but here you can see the, the definition of the microgrid according to the US Department of Energy. I don't want to read all of uh, this. Let me make it shorter. As you can see, a microgrid is a group of uh, loads and resources to operate in both grid connected or islanded mode. And here you can see very simple microgrid structure. It consists of uh, distributed generation, energy storage systems, uh, loads, controller, with or without communication medium, of course, and uh, point of uh, common coupling in order for ensuring uh, grid connection. Okay, because as we just said, a microgrid can uh, work either grid connected or islanded mode. Here, uh, of course, when we use the microgrids, there are many uh, benefits. For example, microgrids can uh, provide uh, electric service to the regions and communities uh, that are currently unserved. Of course, uh, I'm not going to read all these benefits, but uh, we shouldn't forget when we are uh, using the microgrid structure also, it will bring some disadvantages, some drawbacks to the, to the system. For example, it is very difficult to, to meet the supply and demand balance, especially in the islanded mode. And deciding what components we are going to use in the microgrid system, I will talk later about this. And uh, of course, the market impacts, uh, space requirement for battery or other energy storage system as well. We need to think about these challenges as well when we are uh, designing the microgrid. And uh, here I would like to talk about uh, the design process of the microgrids. We need to answer the key design questions before uh, starting to, to build the microgrid. For example, uh, how much generating capacity in solar PV or wind energy or another renewable energy sources? How much generating capacity we need from the renewable energy sources? And the second question we can ask, what do we need in diesel generators, 
and batteries or other energy storage uh, sources as a backup or for backup. And uh, the, the, the next question will maybe what mix will provide the necessary performance at the, at the least cost or with the lowest possible uh, emissions or with some uh, mix of these two? Of course, we can extend these questions. For example, we didn't talk about uh, AC and DC microgrid. Also, it is very important to select which microgrid uh, structures, structures are you going to use. For example, if it is, uh, let's say, data center, uh, it is good to use DC microgrid instead of AC microgrid. And also, what kind of control will be better or which topology should be used uh, to obtain optimal uh, power flow between the DGs? This all uh, needs to be answered before uh, starting to design uh, the microgrid. Here, now we can look at the design steps of the microgrid. I'm not going to give you all details about these steps, just brief information. Uh, as you can see, we need to start with the modeling and the simulation studies. To do that, there are many modeling and simulation tools in the market. Uh, for example, MATLAB Simulating or PSCAT are a very good example for uh, transit and dynamic analysis. On the other hand, for the series, uh, time series analysis, we can use Big, uh, big Silent Power Factory, uh, PowerWord, or KSS Syncal are uh, the good examples for the, the time series analysis. When we finish the modeling and the simulation part, we need to test uh, the developed uh, control system uh, through the hardware testing. The next step is the hardware testing by using the TV emulators, real-time uh, simulators, controllers, etc. First, what we did, we modeled and simulated the microgrid through the simulation tools. Second, we validated our approach uh, through the hardware in the loop or power in the loop uh, testing. And the third and the last step is the field deployment. As clearly we have all these facilities I will discuss later, so we are able to verify our developed control structure in the field as well. So what we did, we plan, design, operate, monitor, and, and at the end in the field, we optimize the microgrid operation seamlessly. Now you can see here the microgrid uh, test options. The, the controller can be tested through pure simulation. If you have just computer and uh, the related software, as I told you, big silent uh, PSCAT, etc. you can just uh, simulate your uh, uh, controller and the system. And the second option, we can use controller hardware in the loop. The power system, as you can see here, uh, the distributed energy resources, uh, grid, and uh, EPS will be in the real-time simulator, but the controller must be in the real uh, controller, such as DSP, this space, or FPGA. In the third option, we have controller hardware in the loop, as well as the power hardware in the loop. In this uh, test options, we have two options, interface real controller, also assets. For example, here, if we have the TV inverter, okay, we can use, and the controller, we can use this one and if we have the amplifier, let's say 4200 amplifier, so we can uh, connect the real-time simulator through to 4 quadrant amplifier, so we can uh, test our microgrid control uh, system through this uh, structure. And the last, as we just discussed, the testing hold the system and optimize it in the field. This is just brief information about how we can design the microgrid system and how we can test it. Now here I would like to talk about a little bit about uh, the components of the microgrids. First of all, as uh, we mentioned, renewable energy resources is the key element in the microgrid. In this slide, you can see the uh, this classification of renewable energy sources. I'm not going to discuss all these types of renewable energy resources due to the time limit. I will just talk about uh, the solar and the wind energy since these are important key players in the, in the future power system. Here uh, you can see uh, the figure on the left hand side uh, illustrates the theoretical potential of renewable energy uh, sources. It can be seen that renewable energy sources are able to provide three times, three times higher than the current global energy needs. 
can see, dollar is uh, 2850 and wind 200 times. And you can see here big portion of this potential and this big like circle is the solar and this uh, blue one is the wind potential. And as a variation of renewable energy technologies, you can see here nanostructured PV to hydro and you can see the, the, the maturity of selected renewable energy technologies. Hydropower and uh, the bioenergy are already major sources in energy worldwide. Other options, although technically proven and available on the on, uh, on commercial items, uh, still uh, I can say occupy only a fraction of their potential uh, markets. And uh, in this slide, I just want to share some uh, data with you without talking uh, too much about it. You can see here uh, global uh, cumulative installed solar uh, PV capacity. Uh, from 2008 to 2000, uh, 2008 to 2018, installed PV capacity of China is almost uh, triple times higher than Japan, Germany, and the US in 2018. And uh, on the right hand side, you can see PV shares of centralized grid connected and off grid installations. And I can say grid connected centralized PV systems are more popular due to their advantage, uh, advantages, especially in uh, recent years, and it's mostly related to economic advantages. And uh, here I want to talk about El Karja solar power project uh, in Qatar. It is the first large scale PV power plant uh, being developed in Qatar, and it is centralized grid connected system. The plant will use more than 2 million bifacial uh, solar modules with, uh, with trackers. And uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, around 350 megawatt will be grid connected by the first quarter of 2021. And the project is uh, expected to be fully grid connected in April 2022, before the World Cup, Qatar World Cup 2022. And of course, another forms of solar energy can be can be seen in this slide, concentrated solar power and solar thermal heating. And uh, as you can see here, also their growth increasing year by year. And uh, especially the solar thermal heating, it reached around 450 gigawatt hour in 2016. And uh, as I told you, the second highest potential uh, renewable energy source is the wind energy, similar to solar energy. Uh, wind energy has great potential all over the world. Uh, as you can see, wind, uh, wind energy is the use of wind to, to provide mechanical power uh, through wind turbines to turn electric generators uh, to generate power. You can see here it's growth in capacity from uh, 1985 to 2018. It is very good. It, only one uh, wind turbine, you, you are able to uh, generate more than 10 megawatts power because this data is 2017. But uh, currently, some of the manufacturers uh, announced that they have 12 megawatts wind turbine in their uh, portfolio. And you can see how uh, the total installed global wind uh, power capacity from 2000 to 2016. Uh, until now, I have talked about uh, the renewable energies, but it is clear that the renewable energy source such as solar and wind energies have uh, some disadvantages. For example, the intermittent nature of, uh, nature of uh, renewable energy sources leads to instability and uh, create power quality problems for microgrids. You can see here, during the one day, the, 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 the power generation from the PV uh, because of the irradiance uh, change, the output of PV will change as well. And also you can see each day is different wind speed and different power generation. As uh, in addition to this, uh, the load demands uh, very significantly during the day or even you can see the summer or winter time it changed uh, significantly. So to, to overcome this intermittent nature of renewable energy sources and uh, the, the load variation, 
uh, energy storage technologies play a critical role uh, in the microgrids. So these technologies uh, support renewable energy resources to provide uninterruptible power uh, to the load. In the slides, you can see the electric, uh, energy storage uh, system classification in terms of the energy form, mechanical, chemical, electrochemical, uh, electrical, thermal, and thermomechanical. Of course, in the microgrid uh, structure, we need to select suitable uh, energy storage systems to, to meet short-term storage or long-term storage. For example, I can say uh, batteries or uh, supercapacitors, they are short-term storage, but on the other hand, if you look at here, the, the large-scale uh, large batteries or pumped hydro system storage is the large term uh, storage. And you can see the discharge time versus power capacity on the right hand side. Pumped hydro is the, is the long, uh, long term storage and it can support the microgrid uh, week or even the month. And of course, when we are talking about energy storage uh, technologies, uh, it is good to mention the potential of electric vehicles. And we can count electric vehicles as the, the battery bank of the future and electric vehicles along with smart charging uh, can help uh, the integration of renewables. Uh, let me try to explain this concept uh, on this famous curve, namely duck curve. In this curve, there are at least four uh, challenging uh, situation illustrates by parts of the duck uh, curve, you can see. Here, I would like to focus only the belly of the duck, the point two. At the belly of the duck, uh, strong midday sun generates uh, large amounts of solar power. Uh, and you can see, and there is over generation risk. One of the promising approaches during these times would be to, to further increase electric load to, to, to better match solar availability. So, for example, if we achieve to store energy at this point in some hall in the in, in energy storage technologies, and we can use at uh, this point or that point to support the grid. So storing electricity for later use can help significantly to, 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 to fill this belly, belly, filling the belly, okay? And as I told you at other times, during the night, for example, if the generation is not enough, we can support grid uh, by uh, the energy stored in this part. And uh, it is clear that energy storage systems help for the integration of renewables. Uh, so why don't we use electric vehicles as an energy storage unit? As you can see here, currently we have around 6 million electric vehicles uh, on the road, and the expectation is around 150 million uh, by 2030, according to, to, to Paris uh, Agreement Alliance scenario you can see here. And by 2050, potential storage capacity uh, 14 terawatt hour from the electric vehicles, and uh, we are expecting 9 terawatt hour from the stationary batteries. To, to achieve this, uh, of course, the vehicle to grid technology plays an important role. And uh, again, it is important that uh, the regulations are in place to, to enable bidirection charging. Some parts of US and some parts of Europe, they already use such technologies to, to to store the energy in the uh, electric vehicle and use later to support the grids or microgrids. Now I would like to move to uh, another key element of microgrids, power electronics. Uh, in my opinion, the most important component of the, the, the microgrids is the power electronics. Maybe I am saying this because power electronics is my major. It converts unregulated, uh, unregulated DC or AC power uh, into the regulated uh, DC or AC power. For example, you can see here we have wind turbine and PV panels. As we mentioned before, because of the intermittent nature of this kind of energy, the output of uh, this wind turbine and uh, the PV panels 
will not be constant or it, it, it will not be within the uh, range, which is defined in the international standards. Therefore, we need power converters to transfer unregulated power uh, into the grids with constant voltage and uh, constant frequency. Of course, there are more benefits as you can see on the right hand side. It can allow us to, to flow the power. It can improve the power system stability. And uh, of course, it increases system security and reliability as well. Here you can see the, the general uh, requirements and specific requirements of grid connected inverter. Grid connected inverter for PV system. The converter and its control uh, structure should meet these requirements in order to, to meet the specific standards mentioned here. For example, this are very important standards for the PV uh, photovoltaic conversion system. And we have also uh, in this slide, you can see classification of grid connected PV inverters. I'm not going to discuss more about it. It depends on, uh, on the system side. You can use the model inverter. It can, uh, the power is uh, up to 300 watt. But you, if you have 10, up to 10 kilowatt system, you can use C-string inverter or between 10 to 30 kilowatt. You can use multi-string uh, inverter, multi-string inverter, or if you have more, let's say, PV power, you can go the structure and use the central inverter. Again, the, the selection of components is a key uh, element in the microgrid system. Now in the next slides, we can see here also, similar to PV inverters, we can see the general requirements or, and specific requirements uh, of wind power conversion system. It's, uh, for example, uh, it needs frequency and the voltage stabilization and also it should be able to provide low voltage right through capability. And uh, here in the market, we can see two types of uh, wind turbine uh, topologies. One, we can say variable speed concept with a small scale converter. And in this one, this, con uh, this concept is only valid for double phase induction generator uh, based wind turbines. Uh, it can be seen that uh, the standard windings connected directly to grid and the rotor windings connected to uh, grid through to back-to-back -back converter. The, the power range of the back-to-back -back converter uh, is roughly around 30% of the, the generator uh, power, uh, which brings uh, considerable benefits to the overall system because since we are using only 30% of the, uh, the overall uh, system power, so the power converter losses and as well as the uh, cost will be lower. At the second topology, we can use variable speed concept with full scale converter. And as you can see in this figure, permanent magnet synchron generator or induction generator can, uh, can fit in this category. And both uh, for small scale and the full scale uh, topology, you can see here, we need to use back to back converter topology. And uh, Although in the current market, most of the generators uh, use uh, traditional two-level two voltage source converter in the back-to-back -back, uh, converter topologies. However, as I told you, nowadays we have only one uh, wind turbine can uh, generate 12 megawatt. So the, the, this, the power of this uh, switch may not be enough. So the need trend in this kind of wind turbine to use multi-level to, uh, topologies su such as neutral point clamped uh, inverter topologies. Uh, to sum up, as you can see here, power uh, electronics play an important role in the, in the future power system. You can see although everywhere in the power system we are expecting to use uh, power electronics. Uh, this is the last part of the presentation, and I would like to talk about uh, the microgrid control and some of uh, our activities in, uh, in Qatar uh, Environment and Energy Research Institute. And uh, we can divide the microgrid control uh, into three parts, the primary control, 
uh, secondary control and the tertiary control or field control level. And the primary control is applied to, to ensure reliable operation through maintaining the voltage and frequency stability. Uh, secondary control part, this part uh, is applied to optimize the power quality of the system. It can minimize the average of all voltage and uh, frequency deviations. And of course, to manage the microgrid communication. And the last control part is the tertiary control. And this control is applied to achieve uh, the economic optimization based on uh, energy prices and as well as the, the electricity market. So the control structure is in like hierarchical, okay? Primary, secondary, and tertiary control. And of course, there are uh, communication medium between each uh, level. Uh, the important point uh, is that the distributed generation system uh, in microgrid needs to be controlled properly, as you can see here in this diagram. And uh, as we mentioned, uh, when we define the microgrid system, microgrid system can work either islanded mode, you can see here, or grid connected mode, this which is closed. Uh, however, this characteristic of the system and the control mechanism are not the same. For example, I'm talking about the hardware. Hardware part is the same. We are not changing anything in the hardware. But when the system is working in islanded mode, you can see the, the DG units, or let's say the power source, behave like, uh, behave like voltage source. And they're regulating the output voltage and sharing power with, with the other source. But when we uh, turn on the switch or close this switch, the system, I mean the energy sources in the microgrid behave like current source, okay? And they have to behave like uh, current sources and regulating the power output. Again, we are using the same hardware, we are not changing anything, but in grid connected mode, you can see the power sources behave like current source. On the other hand, when it is in islanded mode, the same sources behave like uh, voltage source. So uh, the proper control is very important. How we can control? We need to, to switch between, between the control. For example, you can see here, there are three control structures. Again, you can see here the hardware part is completely the same for the three parts. On the other hand, as you can see, the control is different. So the, the important thing, we need to detect whether it is islanded mode or in grid connected mode. And then we need to send signal to controller uh, switch between either grid forming, grid feeding, or grid supporting, okay? It is very important to ensure accurate control of power uh, during grid connection and accurate sharing of power in island mode. This is very important. Of course, the seamless transfer from grid connect mode and uh, to island mode and vice versa. And the last part, I would like to present some of our uh, facilities in theory. Here you can see we have very like a uh, cutting edge uh, microgrid lab. Uh, it is located in uh, Kiri building, and size of this lab is around 60 meters square. Uh, we have, as I told you, we have cutting uh, edge equipment, including PV emulators, real-time simulators, DC power supplies, power uh, quality analyzer, PMUs, etc. And uh, when we uh, tested our controller and the system through the, the simulation tools, MATLAB, PSCAD, Big Silence, etc., after that, we are coming here and testing our uh, control structures through the hardware in the loop or uh, controller hardware in the loop, even the power hardware in the loop. After that, we have uh, also good facilities in the field. Uh, for example, let's look at the, the first one. This is a Kiri OTF microgrid output test facilities. And the total power capacity of this uh, is 215 kilowatts. And we have a 100 kilowatt peak uh, solar PV modules, you can see here. We have uh, 95 kilowatts. We have two micro turbines, you can see here. And we have 20 kilowatt diesel generators, as you can see here. And of course, we have around 150 kilovolt ampere resistive and inductive load time, and it can be uh, programmable. 
and we have a centralized con uh, control and monitoring system. And another microgrid system we have in our uh, premises, you can see here, farm microgrid, because it is very important in Qatar. In, uh, in some parts of Qatar, unfortunately, there is no utility grid, so it is very important to use the microgrid system to, to supply uh, this kind of um, agricultural farm, especially the lot is here, the, the, the water farm. The water pump is working here to, to water in the plants. And you can see we have 30 kilowatts uh, uh, PV. And uh, in the near future, we are going to also include uh, the energy storage system in this microgrid. And the, the last one we are calling is PV nanogrid or uh, PV home energy management system. We have one villa dedicated with our for our research. In this villa, we have five kilowatt peak PV installation on the road, and we have 10 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery, and we have all the appliances, and we are going to develop a home energy management system to, to control uh, the appliances at home, I mean the, the scheduled appliances. And also in the near future, we are going to integrate one electric vehicle uh, system to this uh, villa to, to conduct the vehicle to grid uh, research. So uh, that's all from my side, and uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we thank you, Dr. Ryan. So uh, some questions, uh, maybe if you can, if you can see. read that, that for you. Uh, what are the critical power quality issues in microgrids? That's yeah, it's, uh, it is very, very good question. As I mentioned, especially during the island at Mott, uh, uh, you need to uh, provide constant voltage and constant frequency. Because in the island at Mott, you don't have rigid grid. So Anytime, in case of uh, let's say high load, your voltage or frequency may deviate. So, the main critical part in the, in the island at Mort, it will be power quality issues, it will be frequency and the voltage sec. Of course, uh, in the island at Mort, again, when there is a nonlinear load in the system, it will create uh, harmonics. So, in order to, to eliminate or reduce the effect of this harmonic, there are some uh, specific control techniques or you need to attach some, uh, let's say, active power filter in the system to, to support or uh, minimize the harmonic in the, in the, in the microgrid system. Another question, uh, you know, uh, for microgrids, sometimes generation are closer uh, to the loss. Uh, with the importance of transmission of that, uh, decreasing the future of NOx. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, be uh, because one of the uh, major advantage of uh, microgrids, you can generate your uh, power close to the load. So you don't need, to, let's say, long transmission lines. Of course, when uh, it will bring also some disadvantages. When we are talking about again the islanding mode, it is related to previous uh, question. When we don't have, let's say, long transmission line and the synchron generator with has a uh, high inertia, the system uh, stability will not be strong as much as before. So, again, in order to improve the the, the stability of the system, there are some control techniques. For example you can include some virtual impedance in the system because we don't have a long transmission line. O okay, this long transmission line will bring some disadvantages. What is the disadvantages? It will create power losses, but of course, in terms of the management of the system, it will bring also some advantages. It, uh, it increased the, the, the impedance of the system and it helps to, to ensure the stability of the system. When you are designing the microgrid, unfortunately, the microgrid doesn't have such long uh, transmission lines. So 
you need to consider uh, this part when you are designing it. Uh, there is one more question uh, from YouTube. Uh, I can read for you. Can microgrids thrive in countries with unstable power grid? Questions mark from YouTube. Uh, I didn't hear uh, very well the question. Could you please repeat, or I can. Okay, repeat again. Uh huh. Can microgrids thrive in countries with unstable power grid? It, it, it seems uh, uh, Dear Murat, I cannot hear you very well. If it is in the question and answer session, I can read, but I cannot point. hear you very well. That's my point. Uh, it will help the countries with unstable power grid. Uh, okay. It, it's, it's in the YouTube channel. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I cannot uh, see this question. I cannot hear you. I don't know. If the questions, but uh, from from YouTube one. Okay. Uh, maybe it is better to copy and paste in the, uh, the WebEx can, site. Can you hear me now? Uh, I, I want to try, but <laughs> yeah. maybe Amar will help you help us. Uh, I cannot. In fact, we, in fact, we can ask another question because, uh, as I see, uh, there is another question on the WebEx. Uh, it asks that uh, from the slide uh, 21, can you clarify to uh, clarify the range of batteries and charging station that you reach to? Can you clarify the range of batteries and charging and station? charging station that you reach to. Uh, this question is not clear for me. Let me open the. Uh, 21. Slide 21. Yeah, let me go to 21 and. Okay. Yeah, 21 is here. And its question is can you clarify the range of batteries and charging stations? Yeah, I think uh, if I am not wrong, he is asking about the range of batteries. For example, nowadays the modern uh, cars has around 50 kilowatt hour batteries. And you can, uh, it, of course, it depends on the, the climate condition as well. For example, in Qatar, we have harsh climates where during the summer we have around 50 Celsius uh, temperature. Uh, we can reach around, I can say, 300 to, to 400 kilometers. Of course, when we are using such, let's say, uh, electric vehicles uh, in vehicle to grid technologies, uh, we need to put some reserve uh, energy for the future use. For example, we cannot consume all the energy what the electric vehicle has, and we cannot uh, discharge this uh, energy to the grid. We need to reserve some energy for, for the user of the car. And usually, reserve battery, we are putting around 65 to 70 percent. For example, we can use 30 percent for the supporting the, the grid, and the rest of the uh, state of the charge user, the owner of the vehicle, can uh, can drive. I hope this is the, your question. Uh, this is the answer of your question. Yeah, now uh, another question I can yeah. see. Can uh, micro uh, in countries with unstable power grid? I I'm not sure. I'm. For example, I can give you some example. I don't want to give the name of the country. Some countries uh, they don't have the rigid grids. And again, uh, when you are uh, using the microgrid with the, the the grid connection, the utility grid needs to needs to be strong to support the microgrid. Otherwise, this microgrid will create additional uh, problem to, to utility grids. And another question. And uh, Another question from Samara Kif. Uh, the question is, why the microgrid in 
microgrid in grid connected x uh, as the current source and in island mode as i see island mode x, x as a voltage source actually it is the nature of the the inverter technologies because when you are uh, you don't have the grid if i go to maybe the slides i can because if for example I don't have the the equivalent circuit. Anyways, if there is no any, let's say the the grid or line here, you can see it can work current source. But if there is no uh, if there is no grid, the wall, the inverter here uh, acts like as a voltage source because of the nature of the inverter. You here you have the grid, and you have you don't have the grid. If uh, I'm so sorry, I don't have the equivalent circuit of the inverter in this uh, presentation. But if you just remember the three phase uh, or single phase configuration of the voltage source inverter and uh, just connect the output uh, one inductor and uh, the, the grid, and you will see this will behave as a current source on the other end when you open this one. Uh, the system will behave like voltage source. Another another question from Vesan Rohuma, and uh, the question is, how do you implement the three control levels in your lab? Yeah, very good questions. Uh, in our lab, I mean the it's microgrid lab, uh, we we just have the primary control site and the secondary control site. Uh, tertiary control site we have only in the field. I mean, uh, if I go to the slides, here, right now, we don't have any tertiary control level. Here, you can see in this figure, this each one, one DG unit, and the controllers are here, and uh, each DG unit has its own primary controller based on the R microprocessor. And here, the controller, the uh, OPALRT controller, sends signals to, to uh, local controllers to manage the microgrid. But tertiary control part is not in the last session. Tertiary control, if I go here, you can see here is the tertiary control also included in this part. Okay. It seems that uh, that was the last question uh, coming from old Eric uh, and you too. Uh, by the way, my voice, can, can you hear my voice? There is some interrupt, plus I, I, I will okay, try. I okay, uh, that's all. All for the questions. Questions are now over. Uh, Murat, I, I'm sorry, but I cannot hear you. Was a very uh, outstanding broadcasting. Uh, we are glad to be with you, uh, Dr. Bayhan. We are. Omar can continue. Omar maybe can continue. Hmm? Uh, I couldn't see any question on. Uh, I couldn't see any question on YouTube. Uh, it is yeah. interesting. Uh, I don't know. If you want, then you can uh, write the question because I couldn't see any question on the YouTube. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Uh, Samara, uh, Samara Kif has another question. In slide 23, uh, in slide 23, the connection between okay. the hybrid system, solar and uh, wind, and wind, is okay, say. Okay. Uh, I read this, but uh, it is, I think, missing. Uh, yeah, it's, it is not complete question. I don't know. It, uh, yeah, it seems that the question. Yeah, I think it hasn't uh, been completed yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me. I think okay, 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 okay. okay. Uh, he can complete or he, he or she. 
Uh, yeah, uh, he said that uh, please clarify this combined energy energy uh, in the connection in the connection between the hybrid system solar and wind. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> what I understand. <laughs> now uh, here in this uh, let's say hybrid system we have wind energy, solar energy, as well as, well as uh, battery banks. In order to convert, uh, let's say, unregulated AC from here, AC power, first of all, we need to convert it to AC to DC converter, through this converter, and also we need to convert DC to DC from here, this converter. Of course, uh, the, the control side will be in the microcontroller unit. And here in this, let's say, the orange part is the DC voltage. And we have also charge controller here to, to charge or uh, discharge the battery. And uh, finally, we have one only DC-AC inverter technology here to connect the grid. Of course, this kind of hybrid system uh, has advantages because you don't need uh, extra converter topologies here. But it has also one uh, major drawback because you are all the system connected the grid through this inverter. In case of any, any fault in this inverter system needs to be shut down or off. On the other hand, in some system, in some hybrid system, wind and PV and also the battery can have its own, let's say, AC-DC and DC-AC system to increase the just reliability. But in this configuration, we are using just one uh, DC-AC inverter. And this, of course, uh, reduce reliability, but lower cost. Uh, my voice muted. My voice. He say that. Uh, I couldn't see. I can see another question from the Webex, and now uh, I am looking for the uh, questions on the YouTube. But on the YouTube, we haven't another question. And. <laughs> Because uh, because our live stream, uh, our program, our webinar is on three uh, platform: Webex, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, we need to check all the three platforms. And, uh, Doctor, yeah. uh, now I think it is better to put here. If you have any more questions, or mm -hmm. we can just uh, oops, sorry, sent me <laughs> email. Yeah, you can just drop me an email and uh, I will try my best to answer as soon as possible. Uh, let me check the question last time. Yeah, generally people, uh, thanks for the webinar. We also, uh, we, we would like to thank you for all uh, because of participation. Uh, for your participation and interest, uh, I hope it will be uh, it will be very beneficial for uh, all the attendees and all the other uh, audience uh, who will who will watch the webinar later. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, for Professor for Doctor uh, Bayhan uh, for this. Uh, really exciting webinar uh, and I also uh, would like to uh, thank uh, our treasurer and secretary Murat for the uh, main moderator uh, uh, doing uh, the job for main moderator and uh, I also would like to uh, the I3P Region 8 young professionals uh, to give us the opportunity for this uh, co-organization in uh, the I3P connecting uh, I3P connecting experts uh, webinar series, and uh, we hope uh, we would organize, we would co-organize uh, more exciting webinars uh, in this uh, webinar series. And uh, thank you for all the participation uh, and time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emir. Thank you for uh, thank you. kind invitation, and uh, it was my pleasure to be with this uh, program and. Uh, Hopefully we will uh, see you 
in other events in IEEE or Industrial Electronic Society. Thank you.